A full review on the all new generation of the Audi A6 here today in Autogefuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with Thomas. Exterior special also with the interior, so much to talk about with this vehicle and the driving experience with a focus today on the German motorway, the famous Autobahn, because that's also one of the special disciplines of the Audi A6. Sedan, Bose and Avant or Estate are available. Today the Sedan here is available first. And we'll also take comparisons to the Mercedes E-Class and the BMW 5 Series, special in the driving party today. Starting by the way, about 60,000 euros or dollars. I want you to guess the price of this very test vehicle and I will also tell you later on in the review. And now let's start with everything in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. In the front you always get LED headlamps, optionally you can pick those matrix LED headlamps. They then also come with this cascading turning indicator light and you can see also this light show there. You can even see it at daytime, pretty impressive. It's in the front and in the back, I'll soon show you it in the back as well. And we also had a nighttime driving episode. Today we'll have a tunnel as well. But as we finish this motorway episode here, you can check out our initial review again if you haven't done so far, where we have a nighttime driving special also featuring you know, how, it, how it behaves with the high beam, for example, where single LEDs are being activated and deactivated. Pretty interesting. I will link that video also below. Then there are optional 38 assistance systems available and the sensors, for example, are hidden right there and I think it's great because then it's possible to keep this 3D Audi logo with a huge, huge single frame grill here. And overall it's an evolution of the car for sure, but it has strong, gone you know, a little bit stronger, a little bit more dynamic. This one, by the way, also the stronger bumper here with the S line of the vehicle. 4 meters 93 or 16 foot 2 is the total length of the Audi A6, so the dimensions haven't changed that much. You can see here with the keyless entry also the mirrors flip in and out, S-line batch. Rim, rims are available from 17 to 21 inch. This one here is the 20 inch rim. And Typhoon Grey is the color, by the way, exterior color. Here the tire lip is protecting those rims a little bit. Well, of course, they are already prone to scratch, uh, scratches. Then the main design line is here at the height of the door handles, dividing in light and shadow, pretty interesting, but all a very conservative classic design here. Then yes, yeah, there's another design line shaping out there. So Audi still uses a rather angular design. And by the way, the materials, a mix of steel and aluminum, for example, um, the hood and also the doors are from aluminum to bring the weight down a little bit more. Then there will also be the estate or wand, which will then be going on like this for more room on the inside. This, of course, the more business class style, typical building form. The rear of the new A6 is more like this, so pretty upright in the A Eight, it would be more like this, so the lower part is longer, and in the A7 would be more like this to stress the sportier style. Uh, so that's how they differentiate their rear parts <laughs> at Audi. Here again with the cascading turning indicator light, also at the rear, then this chrome strip all around, so also an elegant design. Yeah, you know, we could live without fake exhaust tips. The manufacturers do that, that they can design the rear always in the same way. If the exhaust just put underneath, they can do here whatever they want. Also, it's better for crashes, for example. Then you also have to pay less for replacing the exhaust when just, you know, a fake exhaust blend has to be replaced. So there are different reasons pro it, but in general, we get the feeling that the community does not appreciate. Then you can maybe just leave uh, that out overall from design element. By the way, it says 50 TDI. I don't like those new numbers because they tell you nothing. I recently now had the experience that some of my relatives say, wait, I mean, does it have five liter of displacement or what? And then I forget, no, sorry, this number means nothing. Um, it is somewhere now step in, in, in a stairs uh, scheme that 
50 has more horsepower than 45. Yes, that is the, it's the meaning, but there's no direct translation of the numbers. And what about this quattro? There are different quattro systems. Let us, let's talk about that. Because with a 3 liter TFSI, the turbo petrol engine, 340 horsepower, you get an S-Tronic dual clutch transmission and the Quattro Ultra front wheel drive plus rear on demand with a Haldex clutch, so no real all wheel drive. And this one here has a permanent one. This is the 3 liter TDI with 286 horsepower, 40% front, 60% rear distribution, permanent all wheel drive, and converter automatic gearbox. There's also the 3 liter TDI V6 with 231 horsepower and also a smaller diesel 2 liter TDI with 204 horsepower. And again with the S-Tronic. And all of those new engines here now have the mild hybrid system, a 48 volt board net. That means you know have higher voltage in the overall board net for all the assistance systems, extensive electronics and so on. And also bigger car batteries so you can have this somewhat recuperation, not like an electric vehicle, but the mild hybrid system helps you to save fuel because it can then better use the sailing or coasting function where the engine is really basically shut off, the car is just rolling and also some recuperation for the car battery than for the electronic consumers. We'll see out how that one plays out, you know, with the consumption with the petrol engine, it didn't do too much. Will it change with the diesel? We'll check it out in the driving part. And suspension wise, we get a base suspension, a normal 20 millimeters lower sport suspension, then an adaptive suspension, and the fourth and highest grade is the air suspension we are testing here today. But there's more interesting things to discover because this car is also equipped with the optional rear axle steering. And I've mounted a camera just at the very top there above the wheel arch. And then you can see that when I'm going at slow speed, can maximum turn across five degrees in a five degree angle across and when you steer parallel later at higher speeds you will then experience that it will go two degrees in the same direction as the front wheels this gives you more stability and here at lower speeds it gives you more agility agility better handling and also 1.1 meters reduction of the turning circle. Then the interior, which is really interesting, Alcantara inside of the doors, and all those galvanized buttons, also with clicking sounds, great quality. Then a matte wood surface here in a dark scale, but I would pick it maybe in the bright scale to have a little bit more nicer in the interior. You don't have really much room for bigger bottles. Um, that's, I think, a drawback. There you can also open the trunk. And this one here is also the S-Line package, as we can see it at entry batch. Then this new steering wheel. It has an interesting grab structure here at the lower part. You can see it's a little bit bigger right there. It's very good to handle. Single frame Audi grille. There's a logo on the steering wheel. Then digital cockpit. I will soon tell you more about that. Everything again with the most superb build quality, you can really say that. Then there are different seats. There's a base seat. You can, in, at least in Germany, in some of the European markets, also get a fabric base seat. That's good. Then there's a sport seat with a little bit more accentuation at the shoulders. Then there's a sport plus seat, which is holding you even tighter, but maybe a little bit less comfort. The sport seats should also be available with Alcantara inlets on the inside. This one here is the so-called multi-contour seat, the top trim seat basically. The comfort is superb and the seat form. Sadly, in the higher trims, Audi does not offer any alternative to animal skin. That's really a drawback. They have to learn that. At least they've been learning that now in the lower segments, but not in the higher segments. 
electric support here and in the front part this button you can then press for the seat massage which is also doing a great job but again all costly extras i will soon also show you a list of the each price of all extras now let's get inside and well i mean it's a basic low sitting sedan so it feels somewhat sporty here. The A pillar is also not too thick. I really like that. The B pillar is sometimes really blocking the view. That's a pity. The steering wheel here, menu setup, and I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen electric steering wheel um, setup. I mean, in the base trim and also for a lower price, that's perfectly fine. But I think um, if you have such an expensive vehicle with so many options, probably you should have that one included, or maybe, I mean, for this vehicle segment, should probably be standard. But then again, most of the other manufacturers do it in the same way that they have almost everything optional. The seating position itself from the seating form is really superbly com comfortable. They have done a good job. It's, you know, a collaboration between the supplier where they have did some research on ergonomics and that really played out well so also as a tall person you can find a great seating position here i'm one meters 86 or six foot one still got plenty of headroom this by the way different to the a7 which has a flatter design there you have less headroom you also have less headroom when you put a panoramic roof which is not equipped right here today with a nice bright fabric ceiling that also brings somewhat light in the interior interior overview the most interesting part design wise is this deco element here which is you know basically as a, as a table here um, here in matte wood there are different decor trims available of course here very drawn tightly very strict design horizontally drawn i think overall pretty cool from design this one i just have wiped that clean with a microfiber tissue because that collects dust and fingerprints the whole way nice illumination at night between two see that in our night driving episode then you can see again the steering wheel which is quite large overall then 12.3 inch digital instruments and on the right side it gets a little bit more complicated with those two split screen setup the lower part will always be like this 8.6 inch the upper part 8 inch as a base like this or then optional the bigger one 10.1 inch and then you have all the functionality as well we'll soon get more details on that there will also be also the, the camera button always be available right there with the fake drone view from above normal review camera and this very cool 3d view like this this is of course very fancy amazing um wow cool piece of technology they can also then protect the rims a little bit better as you can see that here also with the automatic functions so um hmm, yeah very nice to see that one definitely and in the lower part you also have still one knob to control the volume start stop and this tiptronic converter gearbox lever and in the lower part and again nice matte wood surface to open it, for example here for those adaptive cup holders this virtual cockpit digital instruments always pretty fancy you can change the view have a bigger gps screen or then more gauges and of course put in other infos like the driving assistance here in the middle part so a lot of possibilities it is really at the moment i think the best digital cockpit there is however i would also be just fine with analog ones and to the head-up display you can see it very clearly it's a very cool system you have the speed directly in your view also the allowed speed or the assistance system info here for example distance of the acc and the left side you see off-road at the moment um, and this will be the display then of the GPS. When you have set a route, then you will also see, for example, the next intersection there. Then those screens up in details, the map, navigation, look how fast it is and how great it looks. Wow, best CPU unit in the automotive industry at the moment. If you uh, want, to enter, uh, want to enter an address, there are also different possibilities. I'll show you that very soon you know just the rest of your telephone either bluetooth connection or then the apple carplay that's also possible interesting thing is here when i'm in the apple carplay i don't have this haptic feedback i just press the button and there it is and it goes fast that's how i'm used to but in those main audi menus you have this haptical feedback you have to really press it and did you hear the clicking sound 
So, and I don't like it, you know. <clears throat> Some maybe prefer that one, but um, to me, I like the normal uh, clicking better because like this here, when you click, nothing is happening. Also here, in the lower temperature unit, nothing happens. You always have to click, click, click. Yes, having haptical and acoustic feedback is something fancy, but I think from the overall, overall functioning mechanism, it is a big uh, drawback in technology. Heated and um, here, heated seats on the left, by the way, and ventilated seats right there. But again, to press it, I think it's really um, you know, annoying to me. But what do you think? The drive select is also in the lower part. Rather hard to do it while driving, I think. So the question is, it is too distracting. But then you can also use the voice control, for example. I'll use it in German now. Temperatur 20 Grad. So, and then you have uh, 20 degrees. Uh, of course, it works also in English when you have set the language to English, no problem. Um, pretty cool, fancy, or you can just say I'm cold or I'm hot, and then it is also changing. And also the address entry is also working pretty well when you say like navigate to Berlin, uh, uh, unter den Linden, then it also gives you directly the GPS input. So voice command, well done, and also getting more important here. And here you can also write the address. Um, there was recently a comment from you guys, yeah, what do I do when I'm left-handed? That's maybe a problem, yes. Um, I think in this case, well, I mean, you can try it with the left hand, or then you use the voice command to put in the GPS, that's also possible, or it is still possible to get this screen here with the keyboard and then, um, you know, just enter the but uh, the, you know, the letters as you used to. And then there's this armrest. You can put it to the front or the back again and pull it up. This is, again, you know, very great build quality. You cannot shake it at all. And then you can put your phone there for the cable connection, one and two USB supplies and some more room for the key, for example. And this will also be the place for inductive charging. And this top unit is also interesting. First of all, you have here a frameless rear mirror that's really cool and then if you look at this top element right there that also looks so spaceship alike for example you know putting on the lights i think a very elegant solution and you can see some parts here of the bang and olufsen sound system and i can tell you it gives you goosebumps What a 3D surround, but I can tell you it also gives you goosebumps in your pocket. And by the way, optional also available the soft close. There it is, the magic, ah, smooth. So what about the rear? Well, those classic sedans, they usually have this lying back seat position, a small or short rear bench. The knees do exactly fit here as tall drivers and I mean, yeah, no problem to drive with four adults and it's also fairly comfortable in here. Headroom is also okay for my size. Uh, the estate will give you some more headroom right onto the rear, but again, this is not an issue really for tall people here with the sedan. The problem is really with the whole segment here that it's so long on the exterior, but it doesn't give you any decent room on the interior if you consider the length. So this is a fail for the whole segment, I think. The seats is also very thick. Um, yeah, that's definitely a drawback. But to show you, you can still easily travel with four adults and you also have decent comfort right here. You also have a um, rear temperature unit, um, pretty fancy controls and also third and fourth USB supply, but with a very big middle tunnel. You do flip the seats right there, those controls lower part and with isofix at the outer seats and then there's a middle armrest you can fold up for some storage room and also for the cup holders and also you can use the middle part of the seat here as a ski hatch let's open the hatch and when you close it again by the way you have to push it quite hard that it does close here i can also put a trolley inside just so you can see also the height this is quite okay still and then, well, it is 
actually not that easy to access, but it's actually quite okay for a classic sedan. If you want more versatility, go to the Estate, the Avant. And then, well, flipping the seat is not possible from here. It's just some hanger possibility. You have to go around. 112 volt power supply, by the way. Then you have this ski hatch, as I shown you earlier. And then this would be the maximum setup when you put all the seats right there, like this. And then you can also load through longer things. And what's pretty cool is that Audi puts in the test vehicles a list of the extras. And there you can see what is how much, you know, base price 60,000. And then for example, the business package uh, with the GPS and stuff, really expensive. Then the Bang & Olufsen sound system, 6,000 euros, as I mentioned, that's really heavy. And then you see 1,000, 1,000, 1,000 head-up display, matrix LED lights that all gets us up and overall we have the pricing of one almost 105,000 euros Ooh. but i mean it's very good that they show that in a very transparent way it's sadly with most of those test vehicles in that segment that they get so much more expensive Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge. Engine comes to life. We start the driving part. And since we are in Germany today, with a little bit more motorway experience than the initial driving review, which I also recommend because we had said earlier the nighttime driving part in that. That was really very amazing, especially for this vehicle here. So, and we'll first start at about 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour and later on we'll also have a motorway part where we really hammer it through for the acceleration to show you and also for the sound insulation at very high speeds. That will be very interesting. You're already at just about 100 kilometers an hour. This car is really super silent and so smooth and sovereign on the road it's really amazing as for the assistance systems you can activate this lane keeping assist then the car also keeps itself in the lane you should always keep your hands in the steering wheel just to show you that the car does what it you know what it's actually supposed to do um, but again keep your hands in the steering wheel and it is an assistance system of course and you can maybe relax a little bit more However, I tend to deactivate that one um, because I want to, you know, steer myself. And by the way, I'm not braking. In this case, the car realized the traffic sign and also the head-up display and also in the digital displays. Showed me again, speed went to 80. And then the car automatically reduced the speed. That's happening when this adaptive cruise control is activated and you have it in the highest trim because there are several several packages of assistance systems and um, assistance system trims where you can then step up the game step by step you know it also depends on what you really want for the assistance systems to me one of the most important is of course the blind spot monitor that is then in integrated in this left or right mirror each pretty cool system and you can very clearly see that i'll soon also show it once more and the thing is here when driving the car in the city, since we have the optional all-wheel steering here, or the rear axle steering, where it goes, as I showed you also earlier, 5% across at slow speeds and 2% parallel in the same direction at higher speeds. This reduces turning circle 1.1 meters, so you can easier steer around the city also when you're in the basement garage, going front and back, and so the car feels then smaller than it actually is. Of course, you cannot deny that it's still a very long car. So at some point when you search a spot to, to park your car, then you will have problems if you compare it to a smaller car. That's just a natural thing. But steering it around, easing it around is fairly simpler then. At the moment, I'm also driving in the so-called efficiency mode. This is the mode where the cylinder on um, um, so sorry, the, the, the mild hybrid the mild hybrid system would be used also most 
you know, most of the time or have, have the best chance that the mild hybrid system is used been very well. All the engines now here in the new A6 are equipped with the mild hybrid system, 48 volt board net. So for example, when you're sailing and some part of the energy is um, being gained back, recuperation, but on a small scale, not like an electric vehicle. Um, so for the car battery, that is then, for example, taking care of the lights and um, AC and other electric systems of the vehicle, and then not so much engine from the from, uh, so much power from the engine has to be used for that, and the engine can run free. So, and well, I think partly this is working, especially for the diesel, because mm, we have quite good consumption here overall in our test so far about seven liters on 100 kilometers and I think that's that's fairly good so I mean it's a big car and with the uh, with the TFSI with a petrol engine three liter we had as a minimum consumption nine liters so and you know in the middle it would just be about ten so with the diesel when you're going for the diesel set of the petrol you save about three liters of fuel on 100 kilometers and I think well on the long, long term run it might justify it the question is always again petrol versus diesel there are pros and cons about both so in Europe the petrol engines also get the particle filters now in the US they don't because they don't have to so the manufacturers say you know why should we make it cleaner when we don't have to so they don't do it hmm yeah that's reality and the diesels have the SCR cleaning so you fill in add blue and then this is also against you know the, um, the the NOx emissions and of course the particle filters they have been there with the diesels for almost a decade now so these is both particle fillers and the SCR cleaning so um, overall the diesel can make sense for you if you're driving really a lot a lot a lot of kilometers what's the difference well you know when you approach the throttle just you know the, the very first few seconds you know it, it takes a while especially when you're in this efficiency mode so with the petrol engine that's different it's you know already there you know it goes faster but then again the diesel has so much torque so when it gets going then it really hammers it through and the acceleration figure between the biggest diesel here and the biggest petrol engine so far available to, to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour I said well, it's not a big difference so maybe it, it, it's just approximately half a second where the difference is and that's really not too much so there's not a big difference in power then just the conceived power is definitely better with the petrol engine however you can also have the different driving modes right there um, for example, go to the dynamic mode, then the shifting is set to S, and also the throttle input shifts up later, shifts down earlier. Let's see if there's any steering difference. There's also no one behind me at the moment. Such a good control of this car you have. And when we go to the comfort mode again. Yeah, the steering is a little bit lighter maybe. And of course, this air suspension, you can see here, this is the comfort mode. When we're going back to the dynamic mode, maybe get a little bit less shaking, but the differences in the modes are not that huge. So maybe you can also just have it in auto mode or something, and then you can switch with the gear selector also between S and D. And let's select S now because I want to show you an acceleration from 65 to 100. And in the S mode, you also got a more spontaneous response. Now 60, let's go. There we go. Of course, the petrol engine has a better sound than the diesel here. But again, really good power also at the highest speeds from the diesel. Great autobahn vehicle, you can really relax. Then this optional air suspension we have mounted here today is of course a dream of a ride. Really a, like a carpet ride, but not as soft as in the Mercedes E-Class. So Audi already has a base setup which is rather sportier. So 
the BMW 5 Series and the Audi A6 are the sporty approach already in the base models and if you want to go sporty with an E-Class by Mercedes then you have to go for example for an E43 so that's the basic difference the E-Class and the base setup is I would say definitely more softer and also more in general set more on the you know relaxing comfortable ride this is also super comfortable but just how they they've tried to find the the own niche you know the e-class also feels a little bit more relaxing sound installation wise this one here is really superb yes i feel that the e-class is top in the segment as for the sound installation with the optional sound insulation pack all the pressed test vehicles we drive always are usually equipped with a lot of stuff um, you really have a hard time getting some mid-spec cars if we can then we always do that because it's very interesting but then they are always equipped you know with the additional sound insulation package as is this vehicle here and that means that you can drive really really fast soon we're driving even faster and then you can still hear that it will remain very very silent here in that vehicle so that's definitely a very cool thing about the all-wheel drive by the way I can also see it here in the middle display um, you can see that that well from your perspective um, but there's a visualization on where how where how much power is being put on or distributed and since we have the classic 3 liter TDI here with a big horsepower spec we also have the classic Quattro all-wheel drive. That means a base setup of 40% in the front, 60% in the rear distribution of power. And I can really see that, that predominantly rear wheels are being used, a little bit rear bias, but always the front wheels are always attached. So this is a permanent classic all-wheel drive together with a converter automatic gearbox. I feel that the converter automatic gearbox is really great, yes. Mm. The S-Tronic dual clutch transmission in the petrol engines or in the general smaller engines might be a little bit faster at times, but it feels also a little bit more hectic. You know, this one here, the classic converter eight-speed gearbox, feels more sovereign, more a little calmer, you know, in a, in a way. And I also think it's more durable. Also, the permanent all-wheel drive is more durable. However, it maybe consume more fuel the Quattro Ultra so-called for the combination with the dual clutch transmission okay that gets a little bit again dual clutch transmission in combination with the Quattro Ultra is front wheel drive plus rear wheel drive on demand and here the Tiptronic converter gearbox is combined with classic all-wheel drive Quattro Quattro is just the brand name but they have different I think they mean like five different quattro systems which are all you know different uh, working a little bit differently so i feel um this is a you know a big advantage of the diesel then because we have still the real all-wheel drive and the real converter gearbox to me that's more durable i think than the other thing however if you primarily use it on road use you can all of those think that you know front wheel drive is somewhat okay but just to give you that info now again dynamic mode sports shifting and we'll start at about 40 kilometers and just hammer it through you can see again the acceleration and also then how it behaves at higher speeds So now we are at 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles per hour and it's still such a relaxing drive. Of course there are some wind noises but I mean that's maybe like you drive 100 in a, in a normal vehicle. Look here lane change at 200 how stable the car still is. Air suspension here in the you know little bit of play with the steering wheel. I think um, at BMW, they managed to have that a little bit better now, hammering the brakes. Wow, what a braking performance, really good. And it wasn't really, you know, hammering the brakes through, it was just a slight push on it. So I really like how the brakes are reacting pretty fast as well, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I think, you know, steering wheel-wise, 
um, here in those you no know, low angle situations. There I like the BMW 5 Series a little bit better because it gave me a more natural steering feel. That's where the BMW is best, in the natural steering feel. The Mercedes is, um, I think, a little bit too lazy in the steering. You have to steer too much. There I like the Audi better because it is more progressive. You don't have to steer so much, you know, that's good in the city when you're turning it around and also good for sporty driving. With BMW, this is a little bit less progressive, but then again, it gives you a more natural, sporty feeling. So, um, at the moment, I think I would maybe combine the sound installation of the E-Class, the steering wheel of the BMW, the progressive character of the of the Audi steering. And, well, suspension-wise, of course, they're all really great. If you want more comfort, then the air suspension of the Mercedes E-Class will do great. And the BMW 5 Series suspension is also superb, even with the normal, you know, adaptive suspension, which is not the air suspension. It's so great that it feels like an air suspension, like the air suspension we have right here. So then you don't have to say you must have the air suspension. You can also go with the, you know, in the 5 Series with the normal adaptive suspension and you'll be just fine. So. I mean, all of those three vehicles are really great cars, no question. Then they own here, you know, all have their specialties for sure. In general, of course, about this this very segment here, mm. if you compare, it, for example, to mid-size sedans, yeah, you have some more long-term comfort here. Mm, but for most people, mid-size uh, sedans will already be enough. Yeah, it will remain somewhat more exclusive, but the thing is that this upper mid-size class here, or this business class vehicles, mainly they grow in size, so you don't have so much more room on the inside. The package is just worse. It grows really much on the outside without offering you so much more room on the inside. If you compare it, for example, here now to an Audi A4, you know, or BMW 3 Series against 5 Series, you will find some differences, but they don't justify the, the price for real, if you think about it you know, in, the, in the logical sense. For me, you know, when I drive those cars here, mm, I like an upright seating position in an SUV, of course. You don't have that in this very classic building style of, of those sedans. However, this one here also makes you really relaxed, although you can, you can drive it very powerful. Uh, but then you, when you approach the next parking lot or something, you think about, oh, come on, that's so annoying. I mean, it might be different, especially for our friends in the US, when you know, have the big parking lots and you maybe have a, a wide driveway in front of your house or something, then it's no problem. But especially here for, for European taste, those business class sedans are often too big then for parking. That's, that's of course a problem. But then again, if you're on the motorway, then you have the great suspension and the great sound insulation and those very comfortable seats. By the way, good long-term comfort here. So although we don't have the upright seating position, this is probably among the best comfort you can have with non-upright sitting seats. So um, I think also Audi is at the moment from the seat form among the leading car manufacturers especially also for tall people. Often people ask me, you know, what about tall people? Because we have, um, you know, the Mercedes vehicles are often not especially suitable for the for taller people. And also the Asian manufacturers usually don't build so much for tall people. Yeah, I mean, why, why would they? Um, in this respect, for the tall people, for example, Audi and Volkswagen are usually mo most suitable. And seat form-wise, Volvo is to me also among the leading brands always. So um, if you think about the competitor of this one would also be the Volvo S90. And that one also has a superb comfort. So the Audi S90 and the Audi A6 from the seat form, at the moment my favorite as I've been driving all of those. Here, by the way, you can see again in the tunnel how it looks like at night. You can also change the view again, 
yeah, the night assistant, night view, pretty fancy, right? Um, I mean, I've tested that also, but in our night tri nighttime drive, I'm not really sure if I would order it. Maybe someone uses it. I wouldn't, I think. And also, the Y GPS map you can pick, and of course, you can change it around again. So, pretty interesting what you're going to do with those digital instruments, for sure. So, there we have also the blind spot monitor. This yellow indicator I showed you earlier. Again, driving is really this favorite discipline of this vehicle. And of course, as I said earlier, more autobahn drive for you here today since we had some more agile stuff last time. And you know, I'm, I'm not really hammering hard, I just have slightly on the throttle and I have so much torque. That's, of course, a, you know, big dis a big advantage of this diesel. I mean, Look, we're about, just about 2,000 RPM. And it stays so silent and calm. Now we are 180 kilometers an hour and we are still at about 2,000 RPM. So that's really amazing. And the interesting thing is really about those Volkswagen Group diesels or the Audi diesels. I mean, you know, the initial cheat device came from Audi themselves. And so many other manufacturers have been cheating with their diesels. Probably they all have. But Audi and Volkswagen, they were actually the stupidest, you know, it was probably the, the stupidest, stupidest way to do it. That was actually, you know, the, uh, the main problem. And now everyone doesn't see that, I mean, this cheating is really, like, really bad what they did. And, but on the factual clean side, their diesels here are still among the best and the cleanest. So that's, that's really a strange thing, you know? Um, there are some official tables also where you can see that, for example, those Renault and Nissan diesels, they have like three times the, um, you know, the pollution figures of different stuff uh, than the diesels here. And, you know, with the pressure also from diesel gate, all the, you have to get the SCR cleaning and the new, um, you know, new regulations and stuff. So that's, you know, something before, you know, the old diesels, they were really dirty and stuff. But now the new diesels are, in comparison to the other engines, also relatively clean. And, you know, 10 years ago, everyone said, yeah, well, I don't care, I drive a diesel. And now people are saying, I don't buy a new diesel. I can understand it, you know. I don't buy a new, new diesel because it's not, not clean, but it's actually the other way around. So um, I can really understand the hatred toward di diesel and also especially towards Audi and uh, Volkswagen. But again, if you check the factory side, if you buy a diesel, if you want to buy a diesel here now today, the ones they offer are still among the best. And I also really like the big BMW diesel, the three liter diesel. That one um, is the most fuel-saving one. You maybe remember in the BMW 5 Series Touring, we had the big 3-liter diesel with about 5 liters on 100 kilometers consumption. That was super amazing. So the big BMW diesels also really good performing. But then if you think about the customer experience and the driving fun, for the driving fun, I still myself also prefer the petrol engines because they give you some more drive from the you know from the lower RPM regions on. And I'm really get, glad that we also, at least in Europe, get the um, particle filters now that makes those petrol engines um, also a little bit cleaner. And of course, we have the alternative drivetrains. We are, have also been reporting on auto fuel. But, you know, just to give you some some background, I think. Um, it's always good just to you know gather some more information before um, you know before before talking about the certain topics and usually those solutions are never black or white so there's the truth is usually something you know in the middle in between yeah really getting complicated with those drive trains drive trains nowadays even when standing still of course you also somewhat hear the difference when you drive the diesel and the petrol sounds somewhat more refined. However, they manage that you don't hear this typical diesel nailing that much. So if you would just enter this car blindfold, wouldn't have seen, wouldn't have heard what it is, um, you 
don't hear the difference directly, you would check the RPMs, you know, and see, oh, is this a really low RPM that's supposed to be a diesel car. Now we can also go back to the normal D mode or also go back to this efficiency mode. Let's see how the consumption changed when we were doing some high speed stuff here now. Where's it gone? There it is. So the long term consumption wasn't touched that much. The short term was about eight, eight and a half. So you can see when you really hammer it, it goes up one, like a one and a half liter or something. Well, as I said earlier, you can drive that still with about seven liters. And for such a big car, I think that's, um, that's still pretty much okay. So I'll head on to the countryside a little bit. Here again, how great it is reacting. And also, you know, at the rather lower speeds, I feel that the the rear axle is also giving me some more agility. That is really cool. So um, really amazing to feel a car that is that long and still being able to be driven in such an agile way. Pretty amazing. So <laughs> as I told you earlier, there's so much to tell about this very vehicle. Yes, it's a very old conservative concept from the whole thinking of how to build a car then they've put so much new tech in this vehicle you also feel it by driving and overall the sovereignty of these vehicle is really overwhelming overwhelming just to if you haven't understood the word sorry sometimes i you know don't speak that clear i'm very sorry for that <laughs> but i hope you get got all the you know all my major points for the driving what do you think and now to our conclusion here today with the all-new Audi A6. Well, from the exterior, I think a refined evolution, overall very strong one, but still in an elegant way. It is a very conservative classic building style, but I think they found some very nice styling elements. Of course, if you want a little bit sportier, then you won't rather go in the Audi A7 direction. You know, A6, A7, A8, they are all very similar cars with just, you know, some different niche, you know, inside this segment. Interior, well, I mean, the package is not that good. That's counting for all of this segment vehicles here. Of course, you have plenty of room, especially in the front, also in the rear, but considering the length of the vehicle, we also, of course, have cars which are way shorter and still have the same room on the inside. Definitely for a normal low seating position it's one of the best comfort seats there is available especially in this building form among the volvo seats that's you know how i experience it but audi really leading in comfort at the moment especially in the you know the last few years um, as for the seating form together with volvo as for the seat surface of of course as i so told you earlier fabric base but other than that audi is in this case, the worst manufacturer when it comes to offering animal skin alternatives in the higher trim levels, they almost offer nothing. As for the controlling concept, you can of course argue about that. I still like to have separate climate knobs. However, if you then compare it to the E-Class or the 5 Series, the infotainment system here is somewhat then better, you know, from the software into in the intuitiveness. So um and of course, the styling integration is, of, is really well done here as well. Sometimes, of course, maybe even here a little bit too complicated. Driving-wise, what a great diesel bin, what a great Autobahn vehicle. So, so silent, so smooth. Also with the real all-wheel drive, the, the converter automatic gearbox here today. If you want a diesel, this one is still a very good one. Um, the consumption was also quite reasonable for such a big vehicle. The petrol engine will, of course, give you a little bit more fun because, you know, the acceleration from the, um, you know, from, from standstill, from the low RPM areas is a little bit better. The diesel and later has the better torque and it also has this very calm ride also at higher speeds. So it also depends on how many kilometers you are going per year. Overall, it is a very impressive car with all, you know, the small cons and the small pros we have there. That's what we deliver you here on Autogofuel. But this one, again, I mentioned it in the first review, I think that could be best in segment at the moment. 
But again, it depends also on the personal choice. You know, if you want the most soft ride, then the normal Mercedes E-Class will be the best for you. If you want the most sporty, natural driving feeling, then the BMW 5 Series will be the best for you. And this one here, definitely a tech fest. So now, you know, uh, feasting on technology. A lot of different elements that are really very inter interestingly done. And the driving part was definitely also most convincing. What do you think? Leave me your comments in our section. Let's discuss this vehicle further and also tune in to the reviews of the competitors.